Okay, well, uh, thanks all for joining us. Uh, today we're going to uh, do our How to Record Moths course with Charles, hopefully. Uh, the idea of these How to C Record series is simply to get you used to submitting good quality records for the chosen species group. So each group of species that you record have very specific well, idiosyncrasies about recording them. And it's certainly good to hear from the experts to know what sort of information they're after and how best to improve your records. And it, it just makes life easier for them to verify them in the future, to check that your records are good quality and it helps. So what you'd use for birds is quite different from what you'd use for moths recording. So the idea of today is just to bring you all up to speed to improve the quality of your moth records. Okay. So rough course outline, uh, we started a little bit late, but I'm sure we'll be able to catch up on time. So, I'm uh, All right, Mark. okay. Um, yeah, I think we've got Charles. Where, where, where's the picture of me? Now, I can't hear. Oh, I know why I can't hear. This is, this is just so. It's okay, I've unmuted. I've muted Charles now. I think he's joining on a different device, so he'll be able to join in once we've done our bits. Okay, well, I'll carry on and edit that. Okay, so the course outline, uh, we're going to start with a very basic overview by me. I'm sure many of you have seen this before on some of our how to records, but it's just a good refresher. And uh, the common mistakes that people often make across the board, and it's just a good idea to refresh our memories and make sure that we keep good quality records coming in. Uh, then Ashling will give a nice overview of how to submit records and that so on and so forth, and maybe pass a few hints about a new system that's on the horizon, which might be quite interesting. And there'll be more on that on the Covenod Conference. So Covenod Conference is coming up soon, next month. So please book online for that. If you haven't done so already, I'm sure many of you already have. Many of the items will be recorded, so you'll be able to catch up on them. You don't necessarily have to sit through the whole day. You can dip in and out as the day progresses. Okay, and then we'll have a little bit of a question session about recording and what have you. And then we'll mo move on to the bones of it then with Charles. And, uh, we're going to do this slightly differently. It's not going to be a presentation per se. It's going to be a sort of asking and myself posing questions to Charles and he'll then answer them in full. Uh, I think that might make a bit of more variety to our standard systems that we've done in the past. Uh, we've obviously tailored a few of the questions specifically to moth recording and things that we think are quite important uh, and issues that we've come across in the past. And there'll also be the opportunity for you lot to ask questions directly to Charles himself, because I'm sure you'll come up with questions that we've not, not thought of. It just makes it a bit more interactive, really. Okay, so what is a record? Well, it's this four W's again, isn't it? Uh, a what, uh, what is the thing you've seen? You can either use a common name like silver Y, moths, we often use common names because they're, they're quite standardized and very familiar to a lot of people. You can use a scientific name, so autographer gamma. I always think it's quite funny that silver Y is Y, but they use the, I think, the Greek gamma letter in the scientific name, so it should be silver gamma, really, shouldn't it? <laughs> anyway. And then, of course, there's the where. So, where have you seen your record? Where, where have you seen your moth? That, There'd be a temptation to put my garden because many moth records come from traps in your garden or on a wall outside your, your light on your garden wall. But don't put on site names like my garden or... Yeah, just the, don't go anywhere, please. Uh, so don't put anything like my garden or down the road. Uh, ideally, it should be something that appears on the Ordnance Survey 50,000 map so that people can then match your site name up with a grid reference. It's just a belt and braces to check that things are working well. So near town name like Bangor, site name like the Great Orm, 
all good to use for a where. And of course, a, a grid reference uh, is really important because that helps us place the record. Then there's the when. Well, we need to know when you saw that record. And ideally, we want a, a full date. So we want the, the day, the month, and the year. But sometimes you'll be decanting information from uh, paper sources, books, or the like. And you may only know the year, or it might be a, a rare moth that somebody related to you that photographed on film camera or something like that. And you can only give a, a low sort of a year only date or a month only date or a season only date but that's fine just do the best you can but obviously aim towards this end of the spectrum rather than that end because moths are seasonal and it's good good practice to have a nice good date so you the verifier can appreciate when you've seen it and that helps them know whether it's a likely record or not really and then of course the name the who that's the final w so that can be your name it can if you don't know it you can put an on don't put things like me again uh, that's in the sort of category of my garden because in a hundred years time me is not going to mean anything to anybody really so try and be as specific as possible and that's the four w's really so i think so long as you cover all those bases you're going to make a good quality biological record across the board really Charles will obviously tell you a few more particulars about moth recording later on. So why do we record? Well, there's, there's many reasons why people record. It could just be for personal interest. It's nice when you're going out for a walk just to make a record of your walk. And you can do that by recording the species that you see as you're going along. Uh, it has a sort of multi-use multi reason behind it because a lot of these records are important for conservation. So that could be for a local site manager, like uh, a reserve warden. Uh, it could be for a national scheme, wanting to see the coverage across Britain, uh, tracking declines, that sort of thing. And then they feed into these state of nature reports, these records. So unless you're keeping recording, we don't know what the trends of species are across years, decades, and so on. So please, some of the common things are not worth recording because they are sometimes it's the really common species that are the things we want the records of because they're the ones that we can see uh, changes over the decades whereas the rarities we may only get one record a year and they're very interesting but they don't necessarily show those long-term trends quite like the common species uh, species atlases many recording groups now have their own bespoke online species atlases. Uh, moths is a good case in point. Uh, I know spiders do, and so on and so forth. You'll find loads of any group you can imagine, there's probably an online atlas there for you to interrogate. And then of course, there's informing planning decisions. So unless you tell people where things are, nobody can actually consider them in planning decisions. So if you can get the records to us, they will then be put in the hands of the right people and that information can then be taken into account. It, there's no point sort of after a development has happened complaining, oh, there was a rare species there, but I didn't tell anybody. So that's a horrible scenario to be in. So please send those records in and then at least they are taken into the mix then and used for that information. So what to record? Well, I think I've hinted a little bit about that earlier on. So really everything, because we don't know what's going to be rare in the future. There's obviously climate change happening. Things that are rare now could become common in the future. And likewise, things that are sort of on their edge of distribution, some of the more northern species, upland species, they may their fortunes may change and uh, populations decline. So it's good to be able to map those and so you have a record, a tangible record without gaps in the sequence and see what's happening. Rarities are always interesting. We all like to make a note of rarities, but yeah, please do record those common species because like I say, those long-term trends are, are fascinating for uh, 
future looking back at records and what have you and seeing how things are faring over the decades. Well, I did say record everything, but yeah, you don't want to go to town. I wouldn't start recording things multiple times within the day. So I think really common things, maybe once a week, twice a week, maybe if you're really enthusiastic, but I wouldn't go to town if you, uh, particularly with things like moth traps, you can generate a considerable amount of data and you may not want to put a moth trap out every night, but some really keen people do, in which case, yeah, please put that, those records on. But obviously if you're a beginner moth trap, you don't want to be overwhelmed with the sheer volume of records that will be generated. So you may only want to put the moth trap out once a month or once a week, once a fortnight. Choice is yours, of course. So you've got your records, but always nice to have, put it into some sort of context within the Welsh uh, area. And is it rare? Is it a new county record? Has it been seen in my area before? That, these are the sort of questions you want to know as a recorder. So really nice online resources, this is Derin. So take a note of this uh, URL, this Derin website, and you can go on there and pretty much search for any species, not the protected ones, of course, but most of the species information is available there. So you can have a nice map of Wales showing where all the record centers have got uh, species records of your animal that you've just found. So really great resource, well worth going on. Uh, and it's free, of course. It, it gathers records from all four Welsh record centers. So particularly nice if you live on the edge of a boundary between record centres or you just want the whole Wales view. So that's well worth checking out. Uh, that's essentially the in interface. So you have a, a very straightforward what's in my area that will just return all the species within the 1k square. Or you can actually specify a species, maybe a silver Y for instance, and find out the records there. I think with the really common things you'll have blanket coverage. You may wish to log in for a few more bells and whistles, but you don't have to. Uh, I'm sure Charles will talk more about this website, but I thought it would be useful just to have a, a slide. This is Andrew Graham's fabulous resource. I think we're so lucky in Wales to have this. This is brilliant. North Wales Lepidopterus homepage is essentially the go-to website if you're into moths. So please take, take note of that. Uh, website address. You can always review this course on our YouTube channel and grab the address from there and pause it. Uh, so Andrew's made a brilliant resource for Lepidopterus in North Wales here. You can drill down to the records, the information behind each one and always nice to, to go on. Uh, and I, I believe there's lots of, it, sort of information on there. You can see photos obviously uh, restricted to migrants only so there's a body of moth people hunt for migrants much like bird, birders they'll go onto headlands when the wind's in a favorable direction set up their moth trap go looking at, out for those really unusual species that you may see once in a lifetime so i'm not going to say any more about this i think it's one of those sites that you have to just go on and have a play with, see how it works for you. So uh, I think that's my section over with. I'll, I'll hand you over to Ashling, who will explain a bit more about the Covenod systems. As part of our course today, I'm the data manager with Covenod. Um, and I thought it'd be interesting for you to know how moth records contribute to the Covenod database, which as a whole has now got um, over five and a half, well, nearly five and a half million records within it. Um, so, you know, growing all the time, really. Um, almost 50% of the records that we hold are bird records currently, but that does change over time. Um, with the second uh, largest group being plants, but moths do come in there at uh, the number three with 11% of our database or, um, well over 600,000 records being of moth species. So um, really an important contribution to the, 
the database. Um, Richard's already mentioned a Darren, so I won't um, talk about that, but that's where you can go to drill down into some of the records that we hold. Um, now, the, in the Covenant database, I thought it'd be interesting to see what the top 10 moth species were. Um, so that's the list there currently. Um, so with the large yellow underwing having over 12,000 records, um, these are all moths that are very regularly recorded by many different individuals on our system. Um, and I, I do think that the number of moth recorders contributing to our database is growing really. More and more people are getting interested in recording moths um, and um, starting to add the records. So that's really great. Um, so how do records end up in the Covenant database? Um, there are two methods, really. One is the online recording system that I'm going to show you a bit more about in a moment. And the other one is imports from spreadsheets. And when we look at the whole database, 93% of the data we hold is imported from spreadsheets. Um, but with moths, it's actually even higher. So the vast majority of the records are imported from spreadsheets. And it's worth me saying that that includes data that people put into the iRecord database. So um, there's never any need to put a record into iRecord if you've come across that system and the Covenant ORS, because we will download data from iRecord regularly and import it into our database. So you should never need to put your records in twice. Um, but there's still a very important 3% of records that go in through the ORS. Um, and uh, yeah, still a large number of records from lots of different recorders in that category. So I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, also thought it worth letting you know that over, well, almost 90% or over half a million records that we hold of, of moths come from the county recorder data sets. Um, so I don't know if everyone's come across um, this um, system of county recorders. It exists for most species groups. Uh, the moth county recorders um, uh, are part of the Butterfly Conservation Organization, but they are working voluntarily and doing an amazing job collating data and also verifying records that, that people submit to them. So today, as you know, Charles is going to be um, answering some really important questions for us. And he's the county moth recorder for Anglesey, as I've got a, a table here showing you who all the county recorders are for moths for North Wales. Uh, we also have Bruce Richmond on the course today, and he's the county recorder for Carnarvonshire. Um, and then in Marianneshire, we have Andrew Graham, who um, is the person who's developed that amazing um, North Wales Lepidoptera website and also verifies quite a few of the micro moth records across North Wales. Um, so it's another concept that you may or may not have come across, but in the moth world there are macro moths and micro moths and um, Charles may be able to tell us more about that, but basically it's the macro moths are the, the larger ones and the micros are the smaller ones, although I believe that's not always a cut and dry drill. Um, but the micro moths are generally more difficult um, to identify as well. So um, there are specialists that do um, tend to focus more on the verification of those records. Um, so also we have Helen, Helen Bantock, she verifies micro moth records in Flintshire. And Justin uh, then does the macro moths in Denbyshire and Flintshire. So this is a useful table. Um, but you can also get to this information from this uh, page of our website. Um, so it's just covenant.org.uk slash recording. Or if you go to our website, you'll see there's a tab for how to submit records. And if you go to there, it, you'll find uh, find a local expert search. And that lists county recorders for all the different taxon groups where, where they exist in North Wales. Um, so, as I said, almost 90% of the data we hold from moths comes from county recorder data sets. So it comes to us already checked, verified, top quality data, which is brilliant. Uh, 
we also have almost 50,000 from other trusted sources, and that's mostly from something called the Welsh Invertebrate Database that Natural Resources Wales maintains, so that's also really useful. And then we've got um, over 28,000 currently that have required verification, and that's where the county recorders do such an important role for Covnod in checking these records and making sure that they're all um, trustworthy, because um, some of these um, species are very difficult to identify and you might think that you've got the right species name but it just might be something that's very similar so we'll talk more in a moment about what um, evidence you can supply as part of your um, recording that will help the county recorder know whether it is in fact a record of that species. So how to submit moth records to Covnod? Um, you can send your records directly to the county moth recorder and in many cases that will be what they will prefer and it will maybe be in a spreadsheet. So Andrew Graham has developed a very standardised spreadsheet that many, many moth recorders use to submit records. Um, if you're just starting out recording and maybe you record lots of different species groups, the Covnod online recording system or ORS is a good starting point because you can put records in of lots of different species groups. You can attach photos, etc., and the records are immediately available to the county recorder. And we are going to be launching a new and improved ORS very soon, which will make it even easier for the county recorder to communicate with you if, if they needed to check up on a record and just um, make sure that you know, that you had seen the features that would make sure that that was that species that you were looking at. Um, you can also send us a spreadsheet if you happen to have your data in a spreadsheet. You don't need to re-enter it into the ORS. You can send the spreadsheet and we can import it. Um, it will still be available then to the county recorder. Uh, the only thing with that is that it's not so easy to attach photographs and things to individual records. Um, there are two other methods as well that you might think of using, and that's um, to use the Lurk Wales app or iRecord. And I've put them together because although it's a separate app, the records actually go into the iRecord database and then Covnod downloads them periodically and imports them into our database. So it's not quite so immediately available to the local country recorder, but Many of the Moth County recorders do also go on to iRecord to do verification. So it's not a problem if you want to use that system. The main message is that you shouldn't have to submit records twice and you can contact us to check if you're not sure. So a quick introduction to the ORS in terms of entering Moth records. Um, it is 15 years old, so as I said, a new version is imminent and it will be usable from a smartphone in the field so that will make it a bit more useful as well. Um, it's been designed and developed in-house um, so it's very customised to the North Wales situation and, and different groups and individuals that have asked us to develop certain elements for them. There are um, many many ad hoc records entered through the ORS using the standard entry form. Uh, there are also specific projects, um, monitoring projects, groups that can share information with each other's public projects. If there's a specific um, group of species or one species that um, there's a drive to collect data for that species. Um, this is uh, how you log in if you've not used it before. You go to our website, there's a login button at the top or there's a register button if you're new to the system. Um, you can use our whole website in Welsh and also the online recording system. You just switch at the top to Cymraeg. Uh, when you register, um, you have some very basic details to put in, just your name and your email address and a password. Um, and then you will have an extra tab at the top which says members. And within that, you then get the option to enter records and view the records that you've already entered. So um, there's also a bit of user specific content, content at the top telling you um, what you've already entered. Uh, down at the bottom left, there's also a button for my details where you can change things like your address or your email address. 
Um, and that's what you get when you click my details there. Um, oh yes, you can also put something in about your recording interests and that's really useful for a county recorder to be able to see you know that maybe you do have a specialism in moths for example you can put some notes about your recording interests and experiences as well so <clears throat> going back to enter records then um, you get the option of the standard entry at the top and then any public projects that are running at the time we don't have any for moth species at the moment but that's not to say there won't be one in the future so you click standard entry and you get the standard data entry form pops up the first thing you need to do is to select your species group which is butterflies and moths in this case and then you start typing in the name of whatever species you found and you can type it in in english or scientific name or if you're using it um, and a Gamraig, you can type any um, Welsh name there and it will pull up the names for that. So the scientific and English names come from a standard UK species inventory that the Natural History Museum manage. And the Welsh names are the standard Cymdeithas Edward Clewitt names. Uh, you then need to type in a site name and um, Richard's already mentioned making it fairly specific and useful. Um, and then if you know the grid reference, you can type it in. Uh, it is worth clicking find on map to check it. Or if you don't know the grid reference, go straight to the map and you can um, choose whatever grid reference is appropriate. Um, you can search by place name or postcode to get you to the general area you're interested in. Um, the mapping functionality allows you to switch between an ordnance survey map and a um, aerial photograph and you can zoom right in if appropriate if you know exactly where you were. Um, once you're happy with the square representing where you saw the animal you click on the green plus button and then that will pop it back into the form for you and I would say uh, an eight figure grid reference is probably usually appropriate for moth trapping records because they're quite localized. But for other species groups, you might be looking at a less detailed uh, type of grid reference. Um, <clears throat> you can also then enter any abundance information or record type information that's appropriate. For example, that you've trapped the moth at, at a light trap. Um, and then down below where it says attachment, you can attach evidence. If you had a photograph, which often when people are moth trapping, they do have photographs, so that can be added. Um, and in the new ORS, you'll be able to attach multiple records, which will also be useful. So this is just an example of a photograph that's been attached of a Hebrew character. And um, sometimes when the verifier, the country recorder, examines the evidence, sometimes the species name may need to be updated. And in that case, we'll tell you about that. Um, and yeah, it, it can really make the difference attaching that, that photograph. And in some cases, multiple photographs showing different elements of the, of the moth. But I think Charles is going to mention a bit more of that later on. Uh, the final section then on the right of your form is uh, the name, the date and any notes. Now the name will default to your name if you're logged in, um, but you can change it to someone else's name if you're putting in a record on someone else's behalf. Uh, the date, of course, try and put a detailed one if you can. And then something like specifying that you've carried out um, determination based on um, genitalia examination under a microscope is really important because it can be essential to confirm that you have um, actually identified the moth correctly because sometimes that is necessary to tell between two very similar species. Um, otherwise the record might need to be changed to being an aggregate or even a, a genus if there isn't an aggregate. So um, again we'll, we'll talk more about that later on but it's just worth um, saying that if you put something like that in the notes, the county recorder will know that you've done that step and you've looked at that carefully. So um, you've also got confidence at the bottom there. And if you're putting in a record, but you're not sure about it, 
and you want to ensure that it is checked uh, as a high priority, then you can put a low confidence and that will make sure that the county recorder does look at it because we do have a prioritization system that means that certain records, if they're of species thought to be very easy to ID, they might not be looked at, but the more difficult ones will be. So always put a low confidence if you're not sure. Um, you then just click on submit record at the bottom of the page um, and it goes into the table of records at the bottom here. You can just check the details there. If you need to edit it, um, there's a little pencil um, symbol there that you can click on or you could delete it with the bin symbol there. Um, the padlock symbols, which are next to each field, are really useful if you want to submit maybe a whole list of moth species from a particular night where you've done some trapping at the same location. You can lock down the site name, the grid reference, the um, recorder, the date, and then literally all you need to do is change the species name each time and submit a whole um, list of records quickly. So they're really worth using. Um, once you've entered some records, uh, your view records may be useful to look at the records you've previously submitted. Um, you may have a few different projects there that you can select from. Um, it may just be my standard entry records, which is fine. You just click in the box and then click select. Um, well, click in the, in the box to the left, actually, and then click below to view records. Um, and you'll get a tabular view of the species um, there. This is just some swift records, nothing to do with moths. Um, you can add comments to records after you've submitted them, if it's too late to edit them. Um, and you can use this filtering tool here to perhaps look at all the records from a particular grid reference or a particular date or something like that. Um, you'll get options here to say view all records with this species name or grid reference, etc. Uh, you can also um, use the tools button on the top right of that page to do things like mapping your records or downloading them. Um, and if you wanted to filter first, so for example, to see all the records that you've made of a particular species, you do that first and then you go to tools and you click map filtered records. And then that will give you a nice distribution map like this one here, um, showing where you've recorded that species. Uh, the status of your record on the um, right of the screen will tell you whether or not it's been verified yet. So the green ones have all been verified as known or probably correct. Um, <clears throat> this is the, um, if you click on one of them, it will pull up a little summary there of the different statuses. Um, so if the record is incorrect, it's likely that we will have contacted you and said, actually, this has been looked at. And if there's a photograph that allows the county recorder to um, say that it's actually something else, we'll have advised you that it's been changed and then it won't be incorrect anymore. But sometimes it's impossible to tell and it, and it may have to stay as incorrect. If, for example, the species wasn't known in the area and it was very unlikely to be right, but the record will still stay there. So if um, future evidence came to light, you know, it could be perhaps it could be discovered that that species was present and perhaps certain records might be re-looked at and, and upgraded to correct. Um, but as I said, the records are prioritized for checking by things such as how difficult they are to ID generally and um, their your confidence level. And also there are some automatic geographic checks. So um, just on the known distribution of the species, um, if the species had never been recorded from North Wales before, for example, it would be flagged up. Um, that's about it. Um, Okay, shall we start with the questions? Do you think, Ashley? Or... Yeah, I think it's it's Charles. Okay, there you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah can you hear me? And... Okay, Charles. Uh, as you know, we've prepared some standardised questions, which I think might cover a lot of the bases that people are thinking about. So yeah, uh, a nice easy one to start with is which identification books would you recommend for a beginner, and perhaps some of the books that are more tailored towards those with more knowledge of moths 
are there any go-to books to start off with moths that you really should get? Well, I, I mean, the one I use, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I use um, Waring and, and Townsend, um, British Wildlife Publishing. And, you know, that, that's going, that has got fantastic illustrations of all the macro moths. It, it, then that will, I mean, that, it, it's easy to use. That will do for, you know, a beginner and someone who's been mothing for years. Uh, it's just fantastic. It's, uh, the, the illustrations are so good. So you've got that one. I'm, I, just, I mean, that, that, that is my first pick in the selection. And then you've also got, uh, I've seen a, a shortened version of that. Of the, not, not quite so bulky, more useful for the field that you can use. Uh, the, this one, this, is, this one is, this Bernard Skinner one, this is more, more dated. Uh, but there is a more recent version of that with, um, with updates. It's got new species in it. And the thing, the thing is, uh, they use quite different approaches in that the, um, the British Wildlife Publishing one, the wearing one, uses moths, it has pictures of moths at rest, uh, whereas the Skinner one has set specimens. And, you know, they both have their advantages because what, what you're seeing is you're seeing the, with the wearing one, you're seeing the moth as it is in nature, as you would see it. But, but the problem is that, you, is that you're not seeing the hind wings. Although in, in, some, in some cases where the hind wings are relevant, they, they do show the hind wings as well. Whereas in, in this one, in the Skinner one, uh, the moths are set specimens. But, but the, so you're seeing the hind wing, but then at the same time, they're unnatural. And, and moths in the field look look different. Be so where would you get those publications from, Charles? Are they readily available online? From I, I think there would be. I, I'm I'm sure that uh, certainly the uh, British Wildlife Publishing ones would be um, easily available. Uh, there, there may be an update on the wearing one. I'm not. I wouldn't be at all surprised. And Sorry, another no. one, actually, and I, I need to get the um, the newer version of this. This is a good one uh, by by uh, by Chris Manley. That's um, excellent. It gives a photo. Is that a, is that a photographic guide? Yeah, oh, it's yeah. and and it that. That, that has uh, loads of, uh, of photos of, of micros, uh, things like, you know, Coleophora, which, which other books don't deal with at all. Mm. So that, that sounds like a more intermediate publication, if you were well, to... Well, yes, but it, it, well, yeah, but it covers the common ones as well. Okay. Ooh. So, so I, I, would, I would say that it would, it would do for... A, a range of recorders. Okay. Well, it sounds like there's a nice uh, range of books there for all. Oh, no, there, there is. But then, if you're going, if you, you want to get into the micros, and you've got you've got this it, again. It's illustrated by Richard Lewington. So this one is by Phil Sterling and Mark Parsons. That's British Wildlife Publishing. Um, and that deals with a lot of micro groups. Say, say with the tortricoid moths, it covers most, most of them, but you, but you mustn't think that you can do all micros with that because there are a number of groups like the tiny brown jobs, you know, the, say the galekids that, that are just covered with a selection of species. 
And so if you want to really, really get into it, um, here's one of the ones that you, that you saw, Richard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the, these are the Heath and Emmett volumes. And, and the, these are, you know, they are, they are voluminous. And there, there's, I don't know how many, about 10 volumes, and they're quite expensive. But yeah. they, they are fantastic. And if you really want to get into the micros, and I'm, I must admit that they, they were a revelation because I'd been looking at the other micro book and I just hadn't realized how, how many more species there were. And you open a place and there's about 30 identical looking moths. That sounds like a very specialist book. That well, well, of course, they, what they have is they have illustrations of genitalia. So that, that they, they are specialist books, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, you've given us a good range of books there to have a look at. We'll, you can, I guess you can easily find some of these out of print books, maybe the Skinner book on A books or... A, B, yeah, well, the, the Skinner, one. there is a newer version of the Skinner one. Is there? Okay. Yeah, there is. Because um, that one, that one you, I showed you, that one is 1983. Um, but there's a newer version. It's got additional species. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Okay, well, I'll, I'll pass you over to Ashley for the next Yeah, question. well, I suppose this is a related question. Are there any particularly good online resources for moth identification? Yeah. Yes, there are. Yeah, and the one, the one that I, I um, go to is, is UK Moths. Okay. That, that it, you know, it's great. But it, it doesn't, it only includes the species if they've got a photo of it and that they've they've got photos of most of them but, okay. but not all so if it's a rarity they might not have it but i looked at another there's there's uk laps that that's that's a good one and i think that okay. one's good for larvae as well uh and there's British Lepidoptera I looked at last right. night. And that one, good grief, it's got the, the anatomy of the moths. It's, it's incredible, the detail. Right. And that might be a little bit more advanced. Great. But, but, but one, one way of finding out all these websites is to go on to Andrew Graham's North Wales Lepidoptera website. And he's got, he's got all that information as well. You know? Okay. Great. So that's a good starting point then. You there, right. Charles? Yes. Um, is there an online? Um, there might be. I'm not. I'm not quite sure whether you could. I know what I do is I go on. If you've got, say, you've got an idea, you know. Is it you know it's a coleophora, for example? So I, I go through the UK UK moths and see if I can see one that looks similar. Mm. Um, but of course, with many of the micros, even if you think you're close, you can't you can't um, do them without without genitalia dissection yeah so that kind of leads us on to another question I'll, I'll just ask you this one are there particular species that can really only be recorded at an aggregate level it, unless you're experienced in dissection um well right well unfortunately the, the, these have increased a bit the, these aggregate ones because you know you, you used to just happily record common rustic mm. and now it is common rustic or 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 lesser common rustic and and i mean andrew tells me that um that you can't do them you can't do them macroscopically you can't do them without dissection because they although i've heard that the dark ones with white spots 
the, uh, more like to be less of common rustics. He um, he seems seems to think you have to dissect them, which is a pain, because what it means is that all your common rustic records are aggregates, mm. and you don't have any, and it's such a common moth, and you have <laughs> you haven't got any decent records theoretically. And another one which is very very common is is um, Right, are there any references to show Jim Taylor? Um, well, the references are, there, there's these Heath and Emmett volumes. Uh, and I think I, um, the uh, British Lepidoptera website has illustrations of genitalia. And also it has how it's done how dissection is done. And there is also a genitalia dissection website as well. Right. Where, you know, because Andrew said, to me, I've had a lesson from Andrew and he said, but you can go on the website to, um, and it's all there. Mm. Um, yeah, aggregates, uh, you've got uh, rustic versus uncertain. I, I thought I could tell them apart, but then they seem to grade into each other. It's really and tricky then, isn't it? Uncertain, uncertain. I think I, I think I can be certain when, when I've got a typical uncertain. Mm. But you, sometimes you get one that's a bit more glossy, and you think it might be a rustic. But it's very difficult. And they've been, and they're, they're common moths. And then you've got grey dagger and dark dagger. Mm. But the grey dagger and dark dagger have quite um, different caterpillars. So that's an advantage of looking at larvae. I don't mm. know about the uh, common rustic and lesser common rustic or the uncertain rustic. Um, then, then the, the other one you've got is you've got, which has been out recently, is the you've got copper underwing versus Svensson's copper underwing, which are a bit tricky. Mm -hmm. You suppose you look at the palps, but again, I find that there, there are pale palps, there are dark palps, and then there are palps that some go somewhere in between. So that's a tricky one as well. And those are quite chunky moths. So it's not straightforward. Is, what you can do with them, what I've done, is you can knock them out without killing them and spread, the, spread them so you can see the hind wings, the underside of the hind wing. And then they recover. Okay. <laughs> I guess you use CO2 for that, Charles. Maybe not just this week. Um. Well, I, I see thyl acetate. Oh, I see. Okay. That it, it's used, but um, if you just anaesthetize them, and don't leave them in the jar, the killing bottle for too long, they they will recover, and you can look at the undersides. There's an interesting question coming on the chat. So Ian's mentioned one of these apps called Seek, one of these where you point the mobile phone at a, a moth and it will use artificial intelligence to identify it. And right, you, okay. I don't know if you've got any... Oh, the chemical is ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate, okay. Ethyl acetate, yeah. Uh, have you got any experience with those apps at all, Charles, or is that not something? Uh, no, 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 I need to get a new phone before I do things like that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Ian's also asked about uh, references to the genitalia. Uh, I, I guess you always have to ki kill the moths to examine the genitalia, is that correct? Um, well, there, there is an exception to that, actually. That with the November moths, they, you, they've got sort of an external genitalia. So what you do 
again, you do knock them out, try not to kill them. And you, I, did, I have tried this, and you brush the hairs off the, the base of the, you know, the tail, the end of the tail, and you can see the, the feature externally, and you can tell, you know, is it a November moth, pale November moth, or autumnal moth? Because they, they all look the same, you know. So, mm -hmm. so that, and apparently, maybe you could do it with the dagger moths, and squeeze the end of the tail, I don't, I, but I, I think I tried, but it didn't work. Yeah, mm. these sound like skills that you're best shown by somebody who's already doing it. Because uh, ne nearly knocked yourself out. Um, well, you don't. You, you keep clear, clear. Don't, don't. You know, don't um, take too strong a sniff. I often sniff it actually to check it's strong enough. But I've never knocked myself out. Oh dear! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't try this at home, kids. No. <laughs> It's, I think um, it's the laurel leaves that worry me with the cyanide. I don't know, you know, I don't know what that would be like. Whether if you sniff that, but I haven't tried it because mm. there, there, that's another way of knocking them out or killing them. Apparently, it's squashed laurel leaves. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's move on. So we've got quite a few questions to get through. So. If you're a beginner and you're just starting out recording moths, what, what sort of equipment would you recommend buying as a sort of starter kit? Well, I, see. I mean, it depends how heavily you want to get into it, really. Um, the obvious way of looking at lots of moths is to get a moth trap. And get, then you're going, you know, a whole world of moths is going to be revealed to you. But I mean, it might, you know, if you get a mercury vapor trap, it might be quite overwhelming, certainly. Um, other things, a moth trap, well, you want pots, you know, um, like something like that. Plastic pots. Uh, and what I use, I, I use glass tubes because the beauty of those is that you can you can photograph the specimen within the tube and it means what well, means it's not going to fly away. Mm. Um, butterfly net, moth net, uh, um, you know, if you're thinking of collecting, you're going to need pens, tweezers, setting boards, setting paper, all that sort of thing. Um, so it sounds like, but very basic start out, uh, a light on your wall, maybe. Just go and check yeah, I mean, out. you can begin by looking at the moths that come, come to your kitchen window. Mm. You know, you're still going to get a few dozen, spe few dozen species. Uh, I know moth traps can be quite expensive, and I know during lockdown there was a bit of a run on them. And yeah, um, well, the, the actinic traps, I had a look last night, actually. The actinic traps, you're looking, say, at 200 quid, or, uh, and the mercury vapour, it's uh, 320 mm. quid. Um, and with the actinic traps as well, you've got uh, the batteries, these lithium batteries, which are very good, but they're, they're quite expensive. They're sort of 150, 200 quid. Right. So what are the different types available, Charles? Um, you know, say battery versus main power. Well, or... yeah, yeah, that's it. You, you've, got, you've got battery versus mains, and you've got, you've got portable versus less portable. Um, the, you know, if you want to go out into the field, then you can, the actinic traps, well, they're much more portable. Okay. It, but the, the mercury vapor, you can run from your mains and, and um, run in your garden. And 
you could attract a hundred hundreds of moths. But you are, they do throw out a lot of light. Okay. So you, you, you might, if you've got a very small garden, if you're very close to neighbours, um, you might not want to use one. I, I know, I know um, Richard and Catherine Birch don't, don't use a, an MV trap because, you know, they're too close to the neighbours. Mm. So they just use a small actinic trap. Sure. But, um, so you, will, you'll get different, will you get different species attracted to these different types or will you just get more attracted to the mercury? Yeah, no, there's, there's no question, there is no question that some, some moths go for actinic in, in, in a big way. Okay. Um, like in the spring, I get loads of engrails coming to the uh, actinic. And in copper underwings recently, I, I had 16 copper underwings in an, in an eight watt actinic trap. Right. So def definitely there are some species and that go for actinic. Um, more hmm. and I, I find that my actinic trap does better in the spring it does better put in a woodland than than in my garden than 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 an mv trap in the garden it does way better you know it i, I find that there are certain times of the year when the actinic trap does relatively better and the the battery I use uh, is a UASA seven AH battery. It's just it's incredibly light, but it only lasts one season. Whereas I think these lithium batteries would last, um, well, hopefully for years. Okay. You know, the UASA lasts a few months. That's all. It sounds like if you're really getting into it, you want both the mercury vapour and the actinic to catch a good range. Is that? Oh, you, well, if you, you might want to to um, venture further afield than the garden. You might get one to go out into local nature reserves and things and into different habitats. Mm. Well, I see they've got some LED traps. Have, have you got any experience or thoughts on that? Um, I, I, I haven't had any experience with them. I, I guess uh, they're quite easy to rig to a battery. They must be quite low draw, I would think. Oh, oh right. So, so you, 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 Bruce has got one then. Do you want to come in, Bruce, and tell us about that? You can unmute yourself there. <laughs> Sorry, technology. Yes, hello everybody. Um, yes, I. The thing I, I've actually used, which I, I got off um, Paul Batty's website. He's a he. Paul Batty is, um, an uh, he's an electrician and, and sort of like a mother who has gone independent, and uh, he he he's got his he's got a a moth site. You can find it online under. Paul Batty moth traps, uh, but he had some uh, a little device. I'll show you actually, um, and that an LED light. Um, I don't know. You can see this. This is a ten watt. Now this uh, it has a little um, like a stand on it, and this this is good in on when using a sheet and what I have done sometimes is take um, a couple of canes into the wood on a connect to a white sheet and this this is like what you perhaps describe as as perhaps the Americans call black light where it glows purple and it's only 10 watts it's something you in the morning you're not going to find those moths there when it gets lighter but you could you, so you sort of have to be there really and uh you can get some species i i've had the old lady which i don't get in the garden to actinic at all but i found one the first and only time i've ever seen one actually sitting on the light 
So that, but this is an LED. It's got mirrors at the back. What what I would say with the purple LED, I I, I have used them before, and I got a lot of drinkers, but they are better if you're able to trap and not be complete um, competing with street lights or or house lights. They're better in the woods. They're better in the dark total darkness i would say the led myself that's 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 what i I've, I've noticed another one i personally use and i use regularly is something called uh synergetic and you could now they usually uh, um they they you, you can see them I, t I tell you if you are in the area where they do use them is a place called brongoch in the restaurant, they've got this very circular green light. And I think they cover it up with something because it is ultraviolet at the end of the day. But uh, that, that claims to get 20% more insects and it is quite useful. And one thing that has been discovered and I have tried myself is to use two lights uh, where I put the 22 watt circle line, which is green, on, on the, around the entrance, around the funnel entrance, and the blue colored actinic light above. And that is supposed to be a good combination. But you, of course, you've got to have a power source of two, two, two going. But I mean, most of the time, personally, I use a, a 40 watt actinic light because I, I have the same problem as a lot of people have with these I, I have got 160 watt MV but if I put that on in the garden uh, it's everybody thinks it's daylight and they start getting up and going to work so so uh, I'm, I'm not really able to use that very much uh, but uh, it, it's still debatable with LEDs in some way they haven't quite got it right yet because it's LEDs quite directional whereas the other bulbs are throwing light out everywhere um, I know they because the the uh, mercury vapor lights have been banned the bulbs they, they can't I don't know whether that's going to change again but they're not allowed to make them anymore um, and so they're, they're getting more difficult to yeah. get hold of um, but there's something I would say to, for if I could just I sure. that people perhaps that remember when you're using these bulbs that particularly the MV ones they're ultraviolet light and you, you really should wear some kind of protection particularly if you've got children with you or you've got neighbours looking out the window staring at it uh, you should have some kind of UV protection I, I tend to do it with even with the even though the lesser bulbs, really, particularly this, this, this is this makes your eyes go funny, even though it's okay. only ten watts. Yeah. So, but this is good on a sheet. But doesn't the outer bulb on a on a, an MV, you know, say on an MV bulb? I thought that the outer layer filtered the ultraviolet light. It may well do. It may well but do. I know. I know. You mustn't. You know. If you yeah. look at them, you, you get yes, you yes, get yes. really powerful optical illusions afterwards. I mean, you've got yes, bulbs yes. dancing in front of your eyes. Yes, and you don't. Yeah, I, I always what I do is I always, I always do that. I, I don't tend to because yeah. they, they are really powerful. Um, yes, and of course, occasionally, if if they. Like the outer bulb blows, then that could be could be dangerous. I yes, yeah. I, I have I have heard of the MV breaking, and it's still continuing to uh, pump out. Else, it's still on, and I think it was Julian Thompson who who I took over from actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, said that you can find that some of the nettles around it have gone black. So you do have to watch. You always turn it off. Yeah, when yeah when yeah. Um, it, it has happened to me that the old outer bulb has, has blown. Yes, and the bulb is carried on. That yes, I, that 
rare, it happens rarely. Yeah. I, yeah. I, off the top of my head, I, I would say that the screw fitting MV bulbs uh, are longer lasting than the bayonet ones. You know, yes, that, possibly, that's yeah. What I've, just from experience. Yeah. I, I've Do only used one, really. Uh, so. Okay, well, that, that's some really good tips there about bulbs. And obviously, you can get those clear glasses from the people that sell moth traps, which will protect your eyesight from the UV. And I guess some good quality sunglasses if you don't have those. Yeah. So m moving on, we've got a few questions to talk about actual recording the moth. So uh, the classic one we're always asked is, what date do you put down for a record? So you set your moth trap out on, on the evening, but you collect with your moths in the morning. So is it the day that you put your moth trap out or is it the day that you unload your moth trap the following day? It's a, it's the day you put it out. Okay, that's nice and quick. <laughs> yeah, I think I was. I think I I did it wrong for a few years. <laughs> and it's 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 very ambiguous, isn't it? Hmm. I suppose it doesn't matter a day either way, but yeah, it's good to keep well, it consistent, isn't it? it? It it might matter. Say, for example, you had a really good night a really warm night, a really productive night, and then you're putting different dates down for that one night. Or a night, say, when there's an influx of a lot of rarities. Hmm. So okay. if so obviously it's much better to standardise. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, who's Ashling there? I'm here. Um, okay. Uh, Pheron pheromones, uh, have you used those to record unusual moths, Charles? Um, and do you, could you explain how they work if, if you have? Um, yes, I've, have, I've given it one try. But it was, uh, I, and Andrew lent me his, his lunar hornet moth pheromone. So okay. in other words, you have uh, specific pheromones for specific moths. And, and especially for clear wings, which uh, are widespread and possibly even common, but you just don't see them in nature. And so, you know, to actually get one would be really quite exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, when I, I put this pheromone lure out, as, um, Oh, I don't know. It's, it's got a conical top and, and um, like a mini moth trap in the way. And you put the lure in it and, and, the, um, and then the insects go to the lure and get trapped. So I, I put the lure out and went off and did something else. But it, it, I drew a blank because I think it was just too, uh, too late, sorry, in, in, in the season. It was too late mm -hmm. to get the lunar hornet moth. But um, Andrew has had great success. And he has, having never seen the lunar hornet moth before, he has um, trapped these successfully. And, you know, it's, uh, it's exciting. Yeah. And there are other clear wings which might occur. Um, uh, current clear wing, perhaps, uh, there. I think that's been been recorded in the Conway Valley. So, you know, if people's allotments with currents uh, might attract that. Um, and, and there's are they sp they're specific to individual species? These pheromones. Yes, they are. Mm. Uh, the uh, uh, thrift clearwing. That that's mm. one I've seen that in action, and I've seen it working. Um, but the thrift clear wing actually is one that you might see on a coastal walk on a sunny day. Okay. You might. I, I have seen the thrift clear wing by day. It's the only one I have seen. And the, but the other ones, I mean, they must. They're not attracted to lights, and you don't. 
They must come out first thing in the morning or something. Are these pheromones, Charles, are they attracting a specific sex of moth or...? Well, what? I would think they would be attracting the, the, the males. Right, how long does a pheromone trap work? Well, um, you have to store the pheromone in the freezer, Andrew told me. Um, I mean, he he's used his for, I don't know, he must have used, used it for a few weeks. I don't, I'm assuming that it won't carry on till the next year. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I'll def I will definitely be getting some, I'll definitely be getting some pheromones um, and giving it a go because I, I want, you know, it'd be great to see this lunar hornet moth, which is quite spectacular. And then we'll have to find out how common it is. I think they've got a Welsh clearwing pheromone law too, which, which yeah, is pertinent um, for our area. Yeah. Um, Sadly, Andrew, Andrew said his Welsh book clearing seemed to have disappeared. Mm. But, you know, mm. there's plenty of similar habitat. Um, well, his habitat, habitat is upland with birch trees. I mean, they must be tough things. I mean, a thousand feet above sea level, horribly high rainfall figures, you know, and a lot of cloud. And you, but you get these quite spectacular clearing moths. So yeah, of course, it, that, it might transpire that that one, which was thought to be rare, might transpire to be widespread, who knows? Okay, mo moving on to other techniques. What, what's about this thing called sugaring? What, what does that entail? Well, putting a, a sugary, sub, or sugary stroke alcoholic substance on tree trunks and so forth. It will attract moths that tend not to come to light so much. Now, I haven't done this. I mean, you know, slap wrists, I haven't done it. Why not? But, but I think, um, you know, sugar, dregs of your wine bottle, I don't know, a bit of treacle, that sort of thing, sweet, sticky stuff, and put it, paint it on tree trunks and that sort of thing. Sounds like something that people have their own secret recipe. Is, is that true? Well, or? I think it's something that used to happen much more in the past when there weren't. Um, uh, so, uh, Bruce, uh, so Bruce has tried it. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I had very little success. I've tried two techniques that were sort of recommended from butterfly conservation. I, I tried uh, what one method um, was make, uh, you get some beer, ale, beer, uh, or some kind of ale, and mix it with brown sugar and black treacle. And uh, the import, apparently important, important to have is, is a slight hint of rum. And yeah. this was supposed to work, but I, I found I didn't get any success uh, with that really. And, uh, but, but what I did find is that sometimes if I wanted to take a picture of moths and sometimes the moths are not being very compliant, I would put a drop of, drop of something on a leaf or a bit of wood or something. And yeah. the, the moths that do feed will, will take it. But, um, I didn't, I haven't had any success with it. I tried the wine ropes recently, I yeah. stuck some of that, nothing at all. Well, and no, it, actually, that's not quite true. I did get one. I can't remember what it was. Is it, more, is it more of an autumnal thing? I, I just, I used to, I thought it was more for autumnal moths. Maybe I should try it now. It might have been just cold because I live up here in Rizzi, which is, yeah. is not exactly moth city to be honest um, no, no maybe but, not but you get you will get special moths won't you i do i do and I, i'm know, great get, i'm i don't know if you, i don't know if you've had weaver's wave for example i i get weaver's what i haven't had weaver's wave this year but i've had it for the past two years it came to they it actually comes to the kitchen window um really? it, 
Yeah, it's very rare. It doesn't seem to go to actinic light or synergetic. Um, though, and I have actually, dur during the lockdown, um, I, I, I was a, I managed to sweep one by the side of the road. Yeah, uh, with a net, and but the council because because the council weren't cutting anything down, but now they're back at it. Of course, I yeah. won't go into that. that that's sort of, yeah. I will, I'll start ranting. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but and I get ashworth rusty. Uh, yeah. And I probably do get moss. You might not see lower down, but for these the, the ones associated with sugar. I, I tend not to see, though yeah. I do get canary shouldered thorn, a lot of those, but there's very little oak, very little. Uh, I mean, behind me, there's there's a massive spruce forest. Yeah, I think canary shouldered thorns are probably what you call polyphagous. Probably, yeah. But, you know, um, they'll feed on all sorts, you know. Okay, so it sounds like that uh, sugaring is definitely worthwhile trying to get different species. Yeah, I, I think it is, definitely. Yeah. Maybe more in a low, you know, in a lowland woodland location. Well, a woodland location, perhaps. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try it this weekend. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think you, you've sort of hinted that moth recording is seasonal, so you're getting different species through the year. Is that correct? Or? Oh, I, I, absolutely. Um, uh, Absolutely correct. Yeah, you um, you get a spectrum. It, you know, starting starting in March. I would say it really kicks off in March. And and um, and it carries on through till November. And then I don't know. Maybe late November it starts getting a bit okay. The odd feathered thorn you know just in december you know you'll get um lots of december moths i mean the the, the range of species is is much smaller but the thing is with you'll get winter moths but winter moths actually don't seem to come to light mm. I, don't, I don't get many winter moths or or early moths um, coming to light at all so you're mm. probably better off you know on some well not freezing winter evening but some calm winter evening well actually I tell you when you do see them you see them when you're driving driving on a winter evening you get that you can see loads of them uh, the car headlights but they don't come to the moth trap but I it's not to say not not to say don't trap in the winter because you can get mild spells and another you know another significant thing is that you you might get migrant winds you know winds southerlies warm southerlies and and that will bring migrants in the winter and the classic example is um February 2019. Well, I hardly got, I've got very few moths in the trap, but I got you, a thing called Euchromius oscillaea, which was a new Anglesey record, and knee moth, which was a second Anglesey record in, in the one trap. And then I think I had dark sword grass as well. So more than 50% of the moths were migrants. And they, they were good, and they were good ones as well. Are they coming from continental Europe? Med the, the, the Euchromius, I think, comes from Africa. Oh, wow. And the, the isobars, I mean, I'd, it, it helps to be into the weather a bit. And the isobars were going all the way back to, down to Africa. Mm. Uh, and this, and oh. this Euchromius thing is actually recorded in the winter. Because mm. Daniel Brown had it in, um, I think he might have had it in January and February 1998, when, when there were free, was freakishly warm, sort of southerly type winds blowing. Exactly the same situation. And he got this um, 
Ukrainian thing, so he be beat me to it, you know. Well, it's good to hear that you can find some really interesting, special things in winter. And I guess yeah, that's it, 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 yeah, definitely. If 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 it looks like there's going to be really um, good migrant winds, then it's it's worth putting the trap out. And it, obviously, it's worth putting the trap out. If it's mild in February, you'll start getting you'll start getting common Quakers, Hebrew characters, um, pale brindle beauties. They'll be getting going in, in sort of mid February. But it's, in January, it's a bit well. Uh, I don't know. Uh, not in the garden. I don't get much. But it's still worth trying the odd night. So the, the moths are around basically all year. Okay. Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, well, no, this is straying a bit, but I don't know what happened. But the, um, I think it was the 30th of November, where I went in the cupboard to um, get a bottle of wine out, and a long tail blue flew out. That was a very strange thing. We don't know how that happened. But... <laughs> you haven't been on holiday <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Good. Um, in, in Wales, are there any rare moths that we should particularly look out for and where should we look for them? Right. Um, well, well, Bruce has touched on... Oh, plume moths and micro moths, yeah. Um, oh. um, well, Bruce has mentioned two, Ashworth Rustic and Weaver's Wave, and they are Snowdonia species, and they are confined to North Wales. So they're really quite excitingly, uh, they're not endemic, but in Britain, that's the only place you'll find them. And, um, well, you know, go, you can look for larvae of, um, Ashworth Rustic, they do that. Julian Thompson does that at Penn Sutherland. Not something I've done, but they they um, they look they 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 look on the, the sort of heather moorland. Um, Weaver's Wave. I, when I used to live at Vach, when I had Weaver's Wave, occasionally uh, they are another sort of moorland heathland species less common than the Ashworth Rustic. I have had an Ashworth Rustic in Pentrith, and I think the reason why is there was a, a wind blowing from the mountains, which is very unusual. And, I th and the next morning, there was an Ashworth Rustic in the trap. So I would have said that that was a product of local migration. And then the other, um, the other habitat is uh, in rocky coastlines and there are rarities like Barrett's marbled coronet and um, black banded, say found in places like Northwest Anglesey. I think, I think they both feed on sea campion. So, you know, um, putting a trap out in a rocky cove, that sort of thing. So I, I did that with my camets and we were successful both times. Uh, and then you get and you get um, hoary footmen on the coast as well. Um, Holly Head, uh, with Doug Murray, we used to trap at uh, South Stack and we got marbled green, which I've only had there. Uh, so it, 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 it might seem, on the face of it, that it might seem hostile, but um, the, 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 these habitats can produce some quite local or rare moths. So I suppose leading on, uh, are there any particular underworked habitats in North Wales? Which yeah, yes, the there are. Operated trap yeah, yeah. Focus on? You maybe list a few that to inspire um, people. You know, I've, I've been going down to the salt marshes, and I've, 
I've been uh, not not with a light. I've just just been going down with a net and some pots, and and it's teeming with moths, um, mostly micros, and most and and, uh, and quite small ones as well, and and quite drab. So uh, the the one sort of ones uh, that you have to you with the, there's some galechids that you need that. They all look brown. You need to set them, but they're 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 under recorded. In, in fact, what happens is you know experts come from far afield and they visit they visit sites actually that that we don't generally visit. And I, I you know it's a bit it's a bit of a revelation. I went down I went down on the salt marsh and there, as I say, it's one night so it's teeming with microbes. Uh, mountains and moorland, of course. You know, um, you've got problems. You've got you've got slight problems with the with weather and um, and maybe getting there. But I suppose you could drive along somewhere like the Mig Nines and put a trap out. Um, and you're going to get a different spectrum of species. And you're likely to get things that are under recorded. Mount, I don't know, who knows, mountain tops. I think, I think uh, De Debbie found a rare micro uh, on top of one of the mountains. By day, that was. Yeah, well, it's so, like yeah. there's lots of nice habitats in North Wales that we can explore there. And yeah, there's, you know, there's lugger, lugger battery up. Snowdonia, I think. <laughs> yeah, there's mountains and there's rocky coastland, there's salt marsh, there's fen. Fens, I've been, I've done the fens a bit, but of course, rock and of course, pedalia. And you, you get a different spectrum of species. Okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, let's see, I think we've pretty much answered the moth trapping at home. Uh, I suppose this is one of moth traps. You get some very worn specimens. Is it worth even trying to identify worn specimens, or do you just ignore them um, in a moth trap? Uh, I, you know, if I've got a worn noctuid, unless I had, unless I had to hunt you something special, I wouldn't bother. So that's where all the scales of the wings are. Uh, uh, a, may I ask a silly question? What, 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 what's, that, what's the question? Well, the question is basic. Are you asking me? Yeah, Bruce, Bruce had a question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I haven't actually done a lot of going to different things. And I, I, I just wanted to know, you know, when you do go to place, because you, you go to, say, you went to the salt marsh, or you may go something with a trap or anything. It might, uh, I was just wondering, do you have to? Do you need to tell anybody? Well, uh, for, for example, I mean, if you go to Salt Marsh and somebody yeah. sees something like a light, you need to tell the police first or some, or anyone well, I, I that don't you know. do. I, I mean, I must admit, I would be a bit, feel a bit, it's so open. That's yes. the problem. That's the trouble. So I, I might not put a trap there, which is why I go with a net and a few pots. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. If you could go somewhere, say you had a bit of cover from some, I don't know, coastal scrub. Yeah, I, you know, I take your point entirely. You don't want to attract a load of people. No. Just want to cat moths. Um, I can, yeah. And I, it, that could be a bit of a problem in some coastal areas. But I, I went with my camit to, um, uh, is it called Sutan, where the lobster pot is on Anglesey? We went to a little cove to the left of that, and it was fine. It was, the cove wasn't it very accessible, and there was no one there. But salt marsh is very open. And equally, you know, if you put one on top of the mountain, there, <laughs> that might, might be seen for miles around. Yeah. 
I, I'm, for example, I, I want to sort of uh, try uh, a place, I forgot what it's called now, it's by Wine Bard, where I used to live. Um, oh, it, it, I, I can't, I, the, the name of it escapes me. It, it's um, like a converted, it used to be a sort of slate mine and, and it's been reclaimed. Yeah. And I would, I'd love to go there and try and track myself in yeah. there and I was just wondering do I need to um, tell somebody I'm doing it and do, do I, I presume if you are going with a trap you need to and you, you're tra planning to trap quite to you need to be there yourself and not leave it don't you really well uh, um, if, if you think if you're putting the trap in a secluded woodland yeah, and you're confident, and you're confident that no one is going to disturb it. That that that's okay. I mean, of course, you know if you're if you're putting a more powerful trap. Yes. In our, you know, if, if that, as long as it's remote, but if you're using a generator. It, it, um, um, Julian Thompson's had two generators mixed. Yeah, yeah. So what um, I what um, guy Steve Palin he he padlocks the generator to a tree or or you know something like that to make it much harder you know with a heavy duty chain and and then. He feels confident that he can leave the trap as long as it's somewhere remote. Remote, that is. Um, he feels confident he can leave it, but the trouble is on a moorland or something. It's, you can't. There's nothing to padlock the generator to. No. Um, but actinic traps draw much less light, uh, and. Um, you might be okay, but the, the, the trouble is with staying out with the trap all night, it's knackering, <laughs> I've, I've found, and it's much, it's much easier if you, if you can um, find a secluded place and leave it. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but that may well, not it, always be possible. It's good practice, obviously, to get the landowner's permission, so I wouldn't... Yeah, I mean, the goes out and with a salt marsh or something. I mean, it's it's between. It probably is no landowner. It, it, of course, if there is a known landowner, then yes. Um, I don't know whether, say, with Snowdonia, um, you've got an expanse of moorland. I suppose it belongs to someone, or or it's national trust. That's a lot of the land is national trust, isn't it? Yes, the the forest behind me is Axel Resources Wales. I mean, I don't sort of go far into it, but I'll just go yeah. to the edge with a sheep. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I I trap in Pentrive Forest, and I I have to get permission every year. It's, it's a bit of a faff, but it's worth it. So I try I try early in the year to you know do the forms and things and in time for the trapping season but it's been it, over the years it's been it really has been worth it and then yes. i select somewhere where the trap can't be seen from the pathways hmm. um, okay. well, i think it's just good practice because often the landowner may get reports of some strange activities going oh, well, that's on right. the yeah, land it, it, the it's in will... an open site you know, mm. even, even an actinic trap can be seen from quite a distance away. Yeah, and the, the last thing you want to do is call the police out on a unnecessary call out because oh, they've got better you know, things to do. Acute so, embarrassment. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but, I'm sure they'd find it quite amusing and interesting, but I think if right. everybody was doing it, it would get a bit wearing. So, yeah, I think the go go home message is get landowner permission if you know a, a friendly farmer or something. Maybe approach them to see if you can put your trap out there. Right. Like what, what I have done myself in in the woods because uh, there were some 
Um, there's a house with some what people who work in the pub, and one of them nearly phoned the police, but they, I, anyway, I, I did, uh, they, they didn't in the end. But what I did since then is that I do wear a sort of yellow jacket so that I'm not, I, if anybody sees me, they are, that I'm obviously not um, trying to hide something, like yeah. bury your body mm. or something. Mm. Um, in, yeah, yeah. So, I, I found uh, uh, I do that myself now. So uh, I, I'm if I'm obviously doing something that's not trying to. Uh, yeah, thank you, Aaron. Uh, uh, thank you, anyways. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that I trap on the wildlife trust reserves. I've been I've been in touch with them. And that's it's easy. It's easy with the wildlife trust. It's a bit more complicated than RW. Um, yeah, Pentrith Forest. That's NRW. Uh, with the open moorland, it might be a bit more. It's a bit more obscure, you know. Okay, well, that's, that's Most, a useful discussion, anyway. I think yeah, we'll, it's very we'll useful. Covered that. Uh, okay, Ashley. Yeah, yeah, there's one more question that I think we should um, pose probably, and that's about whether we need to retain voucher specimens or whether oh, photographs yeah. are sufficient. And if, if we're doing photographs, are there particular parts of the moth that should be photographed as well? Well, um, well unfortunately, you, with many micros, you need voucher specimens. And I, well, I, I've been, what I do is I probably collect about 50 specimens a year. And then I make a pilgrimage to Andrew Graham because he's, I've, he's been doing, I have not, I haven't got into it yet. I might have a go. I might start with a, a particular genus like Coleophora and, and tr try them. But I, so I, keep the voucher specimens, take them to Andrew, because without, and the rec without the voucher specimens, the records are just not going to be acceptable. Um, things like, I suppose, theoretically, things like um, Ray Dagger, you need a voucher specimen, unfortunately, common rustic, uncertain, uh, the ear moths, they're, 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 um, they're a classic example, uh, it, you know, an ear moth record, I don't think is, is acceptable without gender, because they're all so similar, not, it's a shame, they're nice moths, they're very attractive, but there's, a, there's four different ones and they, they all look very similar. Um, and many micros, but not all micros. But things like coleophoras, the case bearers, that is, these tiny little philonorixas, certainly some of those, uh, these um, brown galekids that you find on the salt marsh, all the species all look similar. So you do, especially as you get more into it as it were you 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 do need to and bear in mind i don't i don't i don't like killing them but they get you get far more predation far more being killed by bats or birds or whatever i guess the old thing is that you've probably killed more actually walking into the field than you are just by taking one or two specimens well yeah trampling I mean, the grass the the number of specimens you take is is is, is um, relatively small, well minute, and you're mm. going to get unfortunately more mortality from birds and bats. Okay, well I think we've covered all the sort of pre-prepared -pre questions, so 